Okay, I think I'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to HIV Center Grand Rounds. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope you and your families and friends are doing well. Hope people who are eligible are getting vaccinated and happy almost spring. <laughs> So in terms of upcoming rounds, um, we still have, um, we will have rounds on April 1st, um, and Tao, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's still to be determined um, what that will be. We do know that on April 22nd, we have a very special rounds from our very own um, Dr. Ivan Balan, um, who will be talking about a dual HIV syphilis rapid test with smartphone app to facilitate self and partner testing acceptability and use among cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men. That's April 22nd. Bob? Just yep. a question. Uh, the April 1st round is canceled, so we'll just have the April 22nd with Ivan. Okay. And what, I, what I would like to add is a special session on April 27th, that's a Tuesday in the morning. We will be talking about assessing intersectional stigma and Seth Kaligman will be presenting. And the announcements will go out in the next few days, April 27th. That's great. Thank you, Teo. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, if there are no more announcements, let's move on to today's event. We have two of our own, which is always exciting. And I'll introduce them one by one. Um, first up will be Leah Timmons, who's a postdoctoral research scientist um, in Columbia University's Department of Epidemiology and an associate fellow now in our T32 program here associated with the HIV Center. Um, they are a psychology researcher by training and they specialize in minority stress, LGBT plus health and healthcare and the psychology of sexual orientation and, and gender identity. Um, Dr. Timmons employs a variety of research methods, including quantitative surveys, qualitative interviews, and comp computerized experiments to better understand the experiences and health needs of marginalized populations and improve health and healthcare in these groups. Dr. Timmons also has a keen research interest in examining the underlying phenomena that sexual orientation and gender identity com comprise and applying this to health research. The current interests include the impact of intersectional minority stress and contextual factors on HIV and other health and LGBT plus people of color. Um, over to you, Dr. Timmons, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start to share my slides now. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Yep, very great. well. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to also throw out there some people will have understood that implicitly, implicitly my pronouns are they, them, I also use she, her. Um, and today I'm going to talk about a study that hopefully is on the edge of being accepted for publication. I'm not going to say it is until I've got it actually physically there, but touch wood, it'll be soon. Entitled Sexual Identity, Sexual Behavior and Prep Use in Black Cisgender Sexual Minority Men. It's part of the N2 cohort study in Chicago. This is done a, as part of research in the Columbia Spatial Epidemiology Lab, which is headed by Justin Duncan. Um, okay, so some background to start off with. So one of the reasons specifically to look at sexual health and HIV health, as I'm sure most of you will be aware, among black sexual minority men is just the huge rate of diagnoses in the US. So in 2018, a quarter of new HIV diagnoses were among black sexual minority men, mostly cisgender. Um, one er, uh, of two black sexual minority men are expected to be diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime if these trends continue. And this can't really be attributed to overall levels of HIV risk behaviors. Many of you will have heard this referred to as a paradox be before. But either way, it's, um, the sort of take home from this is that overall, there's a really big need to focus on HIV and uh, health in black sexual and minority men and how we might prevent that. Um, so one thing that's particularly important to note that's often missed is that sex with both men and women has been found to be associated with higher sexual risk behaviors in black sexual minority men. So that's compared to black sexual minority men who only have sex with men. Um, bis bisexual identified men are also less likely to have used or even be aware of PrEP. 
and research suggests that health disparities are more accurately captured when you look across multiple measures of sexual orientation. It's not just looking at identity, not just looking at behavior, not just looking at attraction, looking at all of these and the associations between them. And historically, there has been some focus on bisexual men and particularly on black bisexual men um, in HIV research for ideas of like what's called the bisexual bridge that there might be transmission from men to men to women in the case of men who have sex with both men and women but beyond that i think it's much more important to focus on on these more socio potentially socio-cultural factors for example one of the reasons that bisexual men particularly black bisexual men might be less likely to even know of prep is there's less integration for bisexual men in the gay communities. There's less of a structure there and less acceptance. But there's a number of potential explanations. The essence of what I want you to take home here is that there just are these differences in risk, risk behaviors and prep use. Um, one thing that's also extremely important to be aware of is that the FDA has recently improved long-acting injectable prep for adults um, Oh, this is actually this might this is actually the wrong slide. But essentially, there's um there's been a lot of research recently which has suggested that injectable prep um would be extremely effective in the same way oral prep is effective in preventing HIV transmission, upwards of 99% effectiveness with very few people who are taking these drugs um develop uh, acquiring HIV. One reason this might be extremely important is that um, in addition to being harder, potentially harder to forget, injectable prep might appeal to different groups of sexual minority men. This might appeal more to sexual minority men who already aren't using prep, and it might even appeal more to bisexual sexual minority men. This depends on a number of factors, for example, why uh, people aren't on prep. For example, they might not want to have the drugs around their house. They might also just not want to regularly remember to take um, their PrEP medication. There are a number of reasons like this that could apply more to bisexual men, could apply more to men who have sex with men and women, could even apply less. We're not sure yet. Um, the study in which I'm, gonna, I'm going to focus on is N2. So this is the Neighborhoods and Networks study is 2 NIA. H awards. Um, it's based on four sub cohorts, one of which is in Chicago, three of which are in the Deep South, so that's Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and Jackson, Mississippi. Um, we at the Spatial Epidemiology Lab manage the three Deep South cohorts, and our colleagues at the University of Chicago manage the Chicago cohort. But overall, we work together on all of these studies and are producing. A number, of, a number of manuscripts coming from these data. Um, so the Chicago cohort is the original cohort, cohort is much further ahead than the other cohorts. This is the cohort that we used um, to sample for this study. Um, in N2, there's a number of waves of data collected. These are done through a number of methods, including survey methodology and GPS tracking in order to have more rigid and objective measures of neighborhood effects. In this specific study, I'll be focusing on the survey methodology. And what we are interested in looking at is the relationship between sexual identity, sexual behavior, and PrEP use, PrEP discontinuation, and acceptability of long-acting injectable PrEP. Um, in terms of our measures, these are the five key measures we used in the study. So sexual identity was a single item asking, do you think of yourself as, and asking if participants consider themselves to be gay, straight, bisexual, or another sexual identity. We also had a series of questions asking about sexual behavior in the past six months, specifically on whether participants had had sex with cisgender men, cisgender women, or transgender women. We unfortunately didn't have any measures whether participants had sex with people of any other gender modalities. Um, we also looked at former PrEP use. We asked, had participants ever taking medicines prevent HIV infection or PrEP? 
We also had a single PrEP use item, which is are they currently taking PrEP to prevent HIV? And we looked at acceptability of long acting injectable PrEP, which is a novel three item scale, which participants were asked the likelihood that they would take long acting injectable PrEP if it was available to them under a number of circumstances. For example, if it caused side effects for a certain amount of time, if it cost, um, I think it was $30 a month was the, the financial measure we used. And unusually, this scale lower values indicated higher levels of acceptability. But for the purposes of this study, we used a median cutoff and reverse scored it. So if participants scored one, that means they were in the higher range of acceptability for PrEP. If they scored zero, they were in the lower range. Um, in order to take to be included in this study, participants had to have a gay or bisexual sexual identity. They had to self-report a negative most recent HIV uh, test. They had to have a male gender identity. So even though the study is focused on cisgender, sec black cisgender sexual minority men, we do have in the Chicago sample a number of transgender women. We unfortunately didn't have enough transgender women to look at the differences in their sexual identities and sexual behavior. Um, but that is something that we hope to do in the future. Participants also had to have had sex with at least one cisgender man, cisgender woman, or transgender woman in the past six months, um, because this was one of the key variables we were looking at, was this relationship between their sexual identity and their sexual behavior. Um, so of the 412 participants, 173 met all of those criteria in order to be included in the in our tests. As you can see, the vast majority were gay participants who had sex with men only. So across the top, we have sex with men only, sex with men and women, and the two sexual identity categories. You'll notice that um, only a very small percentage of the participants who were bisexual and had sex with men and women were currently using PrEP, and that was something we're keen to test while controlling for a number of different variables. So we used modified Poisson regressions. And in these Poisson regressions, we controlled for a number of different variables that are potentially associated both with PrEP use and as well with sexual identity. Specifically, these were age, employment status, annual income, education, and housing stability. A lot of people aren't familiar with this, but um, there is good research that suggests that bisexual sexual minority men have lower annual incomes and are more economically marginalized than gay sexual minority men. So he thought that was particularly important to control for. And then bisexual men are more likely to be younger, perhaps because of um, it being more socially acceptable amongst the younger generation to be bisexual versus gay. So that was one of the reasons we controlled for age. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen now is the risk ratios. We use modified Poisson regressions because they estimate risk ratios, which are not, a, not only easier to understand, they don't overestimate effects when we're looking at particularly rare events, which was very important with our sample of participants where only a small portion of the bisexual men who had sex with men and women uh, reported current PrEP use. And the error bars you're seeing here are the confidence intervals. We use the confidence intervals to test for, for significance. Since they're 95% confidence intervals, that's the same as testing at an alpha level of 0 0.05 using p-values. And we found that when we were looking at either sexual identity or sexual behavior, we had the same pattern of results. So we found that if participants were currently using oral PrEP, that they were, sorry, if we found that participants, if they were bisexual, they were less likely to be currently using oral PrEP. And if they were having sex with men and women, they were also more likely, less likely to be currently using oral PrEP. But we didn't find significant differences for discontinuing oral PrEP or for the acceptability of injectable PrEP. Note that the way you can see this visually is that if the error bars cross over the line of one, that's when they become non-significant. It has to be all on above it or all below it to be significant. Then we created a, a, 
third model in which we combined our um, categories of sex with men and women, only sex with, uh, sex with men and women, sex with men only and bisexual and gay identity. And we compared our three groups of bisexual identified, sex with men only, gay identified, sex with men and women, bisexual identified and sex with men and women, and compared those to participants who identified as gay and had sex with men only. The reason we chose that as our comparison group is it's often assumed to be the default in HIV research and in general research and discourses around sexual minority men. And what we found that was interesting was that when we combined the parts, we created the category of bisexual identified participants who had sex with men and women, that those participants were significantly less likely to be using oral prep, but no other group was. What was also interesting is that only when we looked at that group separately, were we able to see that those participants were more likely to have discontinued oral prep. So we're likely to have been on oral prep in the past and for whatever reason have discontinued. For this reason, we just we think that it's particularly important to focus on bisexual men who have sex with men and women and those two variables combined rather than separate at all times. Another hypothesis we had, which we thought would be important to test is um, in overall figuring out the degree to which um, injectable prep may be applicable to, uh, may, may appeal to participants who had either weren't on prep or had previously, previously taken prep and discontinued. We, in all three models, controlled for and tested those, those two independent variables. Um, the results were nearly identical across the three different models. Um, so I've just presented one set of them here. We found that there wasn't a significant difference between participants who had discontinued use and participants who are currently using PrEP in terms of the acceptability of, of injectable PrEP, but that there was a difference when we looked at participants who had never used injectable PrEP. They were much less likely to be interested or see themselves as taking in the future injectable PrEP than participants who were currently using oral PrEP. Yep. Generally, I advise against taking a null effect as evidence of a, a non significant effect as evidence of a null effect, but it can be evidence of a, a smaller effect or a null effect together. It could be any range of potentially existing or non existing effects within the confidence intervals. And so what, what these data suggest is that there might be just a small difference between the participants who um, are currently using oral PrEP and the participants who have discontinued oral PrEP, which suggests that maybe potentially injectable PrEP might solve some of the reasonings for why participants discontinued oral PrEP. But um, then when we look at those who had never used PrEP, this doesn't seem to, at least on an aggregate level, solve those issues. Those participants weren't using PrEP, essentially said, I'm not, I'm not using PrEP, I've never used PrEP, and I'm probably not likely to take it even if it's injectable. Um, the study did have a number of limitations. So specifically, the test variables were self-reported, and they're based on the past six months. So we weren't able to look at more objective measures. We didn't have objective tests of whether participants were living with HIV or not. And um, there may be something, for example, stigma that may cause people to both underreport their sexual behavior and to not take, take PrEP. Um, and that's something we weren't really able to control for with this method. Another limitation was our sample size. So as I mentioned, we did have some robust statistical methods we used to account for some of the sample issues, but with some of our, our groups, I think we had as, as few as eight participants who were identified as gay and had sex with men and women, were not able necessarily able to express confidence in the results of that group in particular. Um, and overall, we'd want to have larger sample sizes so that we can have more precise estimates of these effects. As I'm sure you noticed, the confidence intervals were rather wide. 
So in the future, we'd like to use bigger samples in order to handle that issue. Um, the sample was also a non-probability sample in Chicago specifically. So you don't know the degree to which these might represent effects that occur specifically in Chicago and whether these generalize to other black cisgender sexual minority men in other cities or in other parts of the world. And one particular issue we had was lack of detail on why. You'll notice um, um, by why there, I mean why participants discontinued oral prep or why they had never taken oral prep. I think in the future that will be particularly important to look at in order to determine both whether injectable prep might be a solution for participants who have discontinued prep and you know as well whether it, that's even necessary. Since we looked at behavior in the past six months, we don't know if perhaps the participants had entered monogamous relationships, particularly if a participant entered a monogamous relationship with a cisgender woman and wasn't having sex anymore with cisgender men or with transgender women or with anyone else, it might make less sense for them to be taking PrEP. One thing I should also mention is that um, when we looked at women, we included transgender women. So whether participants had sex with cisgender men or transgender women, they're counted as having sex with a woman in the past six months. We did do sensitivity analyses because there are differences that are relevant um, to our analyses between cisgender and transgender women, but we found the results played out exactly the same when we when we defined participants exclusively based on their sex with cisgender men and women. Um, so the overall conclusion is that black bisexual identified men who have sex with men and women were less likely to be using oral prep and more likely to have discontinued previous use. As well, overlooking the combination of sexual identity and behavior can mischaracterize prep rates in black sexual minority men and miss uniquely vulnerable subgroups. You'll notice that when we looked at only identity or only behavior, we didn't find the effects for discontinuing prep use that we found when we looked at them combined. So had we not done that, we would have missed that effect entirely. One of the other results we had is that black gay and bisexual men who had not used oral prep might be particularly just interested in long acting injectable prep. And these results can be used to inform interventions aimed to help reach all vulnerable populations. So by that, I mean interventions that are not just focused on broadly, broadly brushed black cisgender sexual minority men, ones that aim to, to have a rising tide that heightens all boats. Um, my acknowledgments and references are here, and I believe some of you will have put questions in the chat, which I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Leah. That was really obviously such important work. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Stephen Sukumaran, to handle the, the Q&A. Thanks, Bob. And yeah, thank you, Leah, for such a great presentation. Uh, our first question comes from Teo. Teo says, uh, interesting work. You control for a lot of variables while making comparisons, but don't some of these variables explain the relationships that are now long, no longer visible? Or are, or are all variables you control for really confounders? That's a really good point. That's a really good point because it could be essentially the case that bisexual participants might be more likely to be economically marginalized and that might result itself in participants being less likely to use oral prep or to be interested in injectable prep. I think that's 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 a that's an important question and I think it's something that it's essentially a different research question. So what we found is that there are these differences that aren't explained by economic factors, but I agree as well that there could also be those differences that are explained, there could be bigger differences that are explainable by economic factors or hidden differences. That's not actually something we looked at, but maybe maybe that's something we can look at in the future. I think I think we will require maybe a larger sample for that if we're looking to test whether adding taking those variables out or adding them in affects the size of the effect or maybe even moderates the effect, but it's um it's an important question. Thanks, Leah. Sure. 
our next question comes from Susan Truss. Uh, Susan says, this is such valuable work. Any sense of the extent of use of oral prep among those using it? Um, as in, in the participants who are using it, how long they were taking it or, or is the question more like their adherence, how... their adherence or how frequently, mm. you know, the, that, that those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so in wave one, we did have some questions generally about medication adherence, but not specifically about PrEP adherence. But in the later waves of the study, we do have questions on PrEP adherence. We'll be able to look at that in more detail. This is Bob, if I can just add to the question. I mean, you may not be able to answer it now, Leah, given what you just said, but hmm. I think embedded in Susan's question, at least I'd be interested in, you know, it's an evolving thing in terms of people, you know, it's it's it, the label, the on-label use is for daily oral prep, right? But we know a lot of people are using it intermittently or using it as they, they, they deem as needed around sexual occasions. So I think the more with ongoing studies, we can understand how people understand it, think about it and how they are using it in reality, because the off-label use is, is um, there's research data behind it about its success. And there are even prescribers who do talk with their, their clients, their patients about the off-label, you know, what's technically off-label use mm. <laughs> um, to use it intermittently. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And you know what? I'm not I'm not certain if we're asking about about that off label um, use in our later waves. We're not asking about it in wave one. I can say for sure. But I think that that's a really good point, and that's something that we we should be asking if we're not. So I will I will look into that and see if we are, because yeah, sure. some of the some of the later waves we're still collecting data, and most of the participants haven't completed yet. So we do still have the potential to add questions. That's great. And, and I wouldn't necessarily use the off-label language with asking mm. the question because it's just, it's, you know, a lot of providers think it's an appropriate use, but just, you know, how are they using it and, and what do they believe is the best way for them to use it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Maybe some language around, around prep as needed yeah. or something to that effect. Any other questions for Leah? Leah, you have some uh, notes from Rebecca Jaguer and Sui Hoffman, both saying excellent presentation and work. Thank you, thank you both. And thank, thank you all for your kind words. Okay, if there are no other questions now, we can move on. And actually more may come up because we have a, a, a theme going across both of these presentations. So, you know, there may be more questions for you, Leah, after um, we hear from Ofoli and Baco. Um, so if we're ready Great. to to move on. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Afoli Mbako, who completed his medical degree at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and his internal medicine residency and chief residency at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. He's currently a third year infectious disease fellow at Columbia University Medical Center, um, where he works as an HIV primary care physician and he previously has worked for the Center for Urban Epidemiological Studies at the New York Academy of Medicine, studying the effects of club drug use on HIV risk as an affiliate investigator in the Center for Drug Use and HIV Risk, where he focused on the experiences of black men who have sex with men along the HIV care continuum, and also in Dr. Dustin Duncan's spatial epidemiology lab. Um, Dustin Duncan's name is coming up across supporting both of our fellows here, which is great. Um, as a current postdoctoral fellow at the HIV Center, um, Afoli's research focuses on biobehavioral interventions and outcomes for racial, gender, and sexual minorities living with HIV. He's interested in the impact of interventions such as immediate antiviral therapy, or some people call it iArt, um, and other novel technologies on retention and care, art adherence and viral load suppression among marginalized populations. Dr. Mbako is also broadly interested in health equity and HIV care, specifically how trauma, structural racism and homophobia impact clinical HIV related clinical outcomes. So over to you, Afole. You're on mute. Sorry. Hey. Hi. <laughs> 
Of course I would do that. Um, can, <laughs> can you guys, you guys can see the screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, thank you, Bob. Um, it's a pleasure to be with everybody today. And um, thank you for giving me a reason to put on a shirt and tie, which I have not done in a very long time. Um, so I'm gonna dive right into this talk because I tried to pack a lot into uh, this 20, 25 minutes we have allotted. Um, so I have no disclosures. My objectives today, first to define systemic racism in the context of HIV care for black MSM. Um, to understand the historical roots of this systemic racism, uh, to discuss some examples of how systemic racism works along the HIV care continuum, and then lastly to consider HIV diagnosis as a critical moment for HIV research and intervention. Um, and just to orient everybody, I'm kind of going to be focused mostly on um, what happens to these men after they're diagnosed, uh, mostly focused on um, that part of the cascade um, and a little bit on, on prevention, but not, not as much. So first, defining systemic racism. There are tons of different definitions out there, um, but I kind of just pulled these two because I think that they sum it up pretty well. That systemic racism is a social system of racial stratification that has been maintained to limit people of color's access to and participation in social, educational, economic, and political processes. And it's also evident in unequal outcomes based on race and social systems and organizations, such as those in educational, mental health, health, occupational, and political realms. And in the context of Black MSM, we can't have this discussion without discussing intersectionality. And this is Audre Lorde, who um, is Many, of, many people know as a civil rights hero, um, who uh, basically in her work gave permission for us to think about um, intersectionality, right? That, inter that experiences at the micro level um, are always reflecting interlocking systems of oppression at the macro level. So when we're talking about racism, um, it's uh, impossible to have that discussion without discussing homophobia, um, uh, gender inequity, disability. Um, and, a, and a whole bunch of different uh, systems of oppression. And just as an example, um, I think you know this past year has really made the whole country uh, more aware of what systemic racism means and how what role it plays in our lives. So, um, thinking about uh, HIV and COVID nineteen, um, this was a recent study looking at uh, racial segregation um, and rates of COVID nineteen in the last year. Um, as well as rates of HIV. And so essentially it looked at different regions of the country and it looked at the percent of county population that was non-Hispanic white. And you can see this kind of red auburn color, um, which has the lowest percentage of white Americans, had the highest percentage of COVID-19, both before the first reopening um, of most states on May 15th and after. Um, and so as you increase that that percentage of the white population in these counties, you actually decrease COVID-19 rates. Um, and you see the same thing with HIV in the last year. This is from CDC Atlas data um, that you know, new diagnoses per 100,000 population, um, you see decreasing substantially as you increase the number of, um, of white Americans in a population. Um, so this really is telling us that racial segregation determines one's HIV and COVID-19 risk. And this is a great example of how systemic racism works in terms of um, infections and epidemics. Um, Liad already kind of talked about the disproportionate burden that Black MSM face with, in terms of the HIV epidemic. Um, as she said, as, as um, a, a greater than a quarter of um, you know, uh, new diagnoses were um, Black, gay, and bisexual men. And um, we know that this is also um, more uh, significant in the lower age range um, when we're thinking about ages 30, 13 to 34. Um, and, you know, I think trends by age, looking at um, the last few years from 2014 to 2018, there are certain age groups where it's actually increasing, right? Increased uh, in the 25 to 34 group um, and stayed stable from 35 to 44. Um, and this burden is mostly felt in the Southern United States with greater than 50% of new diagnoses um, in this part of the country, um, the majority of whom are black MSM.
So despite groundbreaking advances in PrEP and HIV status neutral programs, um, more effective antiretroviral therapy in the form of integrase inhibitors and two drug regimens, national and local and the epidemic initiatives, as well as expansion of health insurance access, um, and advancements in behavioral science and a greater understanding of these HIV related health disparities. Um, still, we have not been able to alter this curve, right? This is from Patrick Sullivan's group in a recent Lancet series. Um, and this is showing between 2009 and 2018, um, this uh, different, um, the different lines represent different races and ethnicities of MSM. Um, and this line is showing that we really haven't made a dent um, among black MSM in the, la in the last decade. So really, I want to turn to understanding some of these historical roots. Um, so this is a study in JAMA from 1987. Um, these are the authors, and top left is Warren Winkelstein, who actually uh, trained, I think, at Columbia many, many years ago, and unfortunately um, uh, passed away. And Michael Samuels, who was his postdoc at the time, who was the lead author on this study. And it was looking at the prevalence of HIV um, by ethnicity. It was um, from the San Francisco Men's Health Study. And you can see even early on, there's already this signal of a racial disparity in new diagnoses. Um, and in table two, I um, also wanted to point out that in terms of HIV, HIV risk behaviors, even early on, you don't see that there's a big difference or a statistically significant difference um, between those groups. So I actually called Michael Samuels because I you know, saw that he was um, has been working for a long time out in California as a professor of epidemiology. And I asked him kind of doing this study this early on, how was it received um, at the time? And he said, we started looking at race ethnicity data and statistically significant differences, no, no, no longer looking just at STD clinics, but at population-based data. It got less attention than I imagined it would. There were a number of us constantly making presentations to lay audiences in the Bay Area. It was so perceived as a white gay issue, the disparities were not something not noted or accounted for. It's pretty, pretty shocking, right? I think that this, this notion of invisibility at the beginning of the um, epidemic, um, which is part of structural racism and how it works, um, really has had a huge impact on HIV epidemiology. So Joseph Beam was a black writer from Philadelphia who died of AIDS um, at age 33. And he grappled with um, kind of understanding the benefits of invisibility for um, such a marginalized community, but was really pushing for more visibility um, for more resources and more kind of understanding to, to save his community. Um, and this book by uh, Dr. Sonia McKenzie, Structural Intimacies, actually um, uh, from a sociological perspective, recounts stories from uh, young black gay men at that time in the 80s um, from Chicago and Detroit and different parts of the country who actually believed that if they didn't have sex with a white gay man in San Francisco, that they were safe from HIV infection. And then later in the 90s, as the numbers within the Black community really um, started to become um, a crisis that the country couldn't ignore, particularly also among Black women, this idea of the down low phenomenon, right, this idea that Black men living ostensibly straight lives, um, but then having sex with other men behind closed doors, becoming HIV infected and spreading that in their community really became um, such a central focus um, for the country. Um, and this is a, um, a study that kind of really uh, broke down how this actually is a part of systemic racism and how it works, right? The policing of Black male sexual behavior and the um, kind of trope really rooted in slavery of the virile kind of out of control um, uh, black man and in terms of sexual mores. Um, and this paper kind of talks about how the down low is not new. The down low isn't just black. The down low isn't just men. And the down low discourse actually contributes to homophobia in the black community and to the spread of HIV AIDS. Um, and in addition to um, that paper, I think the scientific community really mobilized to kind of talk about what are the disparities between black and white uh, men who have sex with men. And this uh, landmark paper by Greg Millett, um, which was a meta-analysis of 53 quantitative studies, really showed that um, black MSM actually reported less substance abuse, fewer sexual partners, um, less um, and 
sorry, um, and less disclosure of same-sex behavior, um, and there were no differences in reported condomless anal intercourse or commercial sex work or sex with known HIV positive partners. So really this led to, um, this and many other studies led to a shift from a, um, a kind of laser focus on individual behavior um, to many systemic barriers. Um, and this paper a few years later, um, who our own Patrick Wilson was a co-author, um, really kind of looked at um, the impact of less insurance, right, uh, higher incarceration, um, as some of these systemic um, important causes um, that lead to the great disparities that we see. So now I just want to discuss some examples of how I think systemic racism is working along the HIV care continuum. So first, I think something that's not discussed as much, but is representation. Um, this is an article, a commentary um, that I wrote in JAMA that was published a couple of years ago, where I really kind of talked about my experience with a Black gay gentleman in his 50s who was HIV positive, um, and my inability at our first meeting to kind of um, actually get through the visit because he was so shocked that he had a Black gay doctor, um, but how our relationship and our shared kind of understanding um, has actually, I think, been critical to um, him remaining virally suppressed. Um, and throughout the country, thinking about just physicians, because I'm thinking about my specific role, um, only 5% of physicians in the US in 2018 were Black or African American. So even less than that number um, are men and less than that are gay men. Um, and a 2016 study in CID, which was a probability sample of about 2000 HIV care providers, um, showed that about 11% of that sample was Black or African American. So a little bit better than the national rates, but still much, much lower um, in comparison to the percentage of new diagnoses we see. So moving from representation to retention, right? Um, not only are these men not seeing folks represented um, in the um, um, in HIV care when they enter enter the system, um, but when they fall out of the system, we don't really have a good understanding of what's causing um, them to become disengaged. So this paper kind of looking at critical race theory, I think shows why it's such an important tool to be able to tease out some of those factors because racism does like to hide. Um, and we had a great talk on Tuesday, so I won't um, go too much into critical race theory, uh, but this study um, was mostly among black, gay and bisexual men, and they coded um, specifically uh, with many a priori codes relevant to uh, critical race theory and attended to the data with an intersectional understanding of the intersectional nature of these social categories. And their results really showed that race was defined as the primary factor uh, for a lot of these uh, participants for negatively impacting their healthcare experiences. That healthcare decisions were made through the lens of uh, suspicion given uh, historical and cultural context. And that racism leads to distrust of medical institutions, perception of healthcare as over institutionalized, um, perception of exclusion from decision making processes, and an overemphasis on antiretroviral treatment. Foley, I just want to reassure you that I have plenty of time. I mean, I don't think you're rushing, but I just want you to know oh, that you. You, you've got you've got a lot of time. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, um, I'm. I know I'm also speaking fast, so thank yeah, you. It's good. <laughs> um, so, in terms of um, other areas along the care continuum and how systemic racism plays a role, really thinking about psychological well-being, right? Um, so a high percentage of gay black men report experiences of racism in the gay community, um, leading to higher stress levels and negative health outcomes. Um, and this study by Han et al, which kind of looked at stress and coping with racism and its association with HIV uh, risk, um, really looked at uh, how social discrimination, social networks and sexual partnerships are um, are related um, with um, HIV risk behaviors. So this uh, group looked at ethnic minority men in LA, um, Black, Asian, Pacific Islander, and Latino MSM, both HIV positive and HIV negative, and recruited about 400 of each of those groups. And measures included um, a stress from racism in the gay community index, um, coping with racism uh, measures, and uh, sexual risk behavior measures. And they found that 63% of Black gay men reported feeling stressed from racism in the gay community, 
um, and stress caused by perceived racism in the gay community actually increased the likelihood of engaging in unprotected anal intercourse. And so these are some of the, these are the bivariate and multivariate um, analyses. And you can see here the statistically significant associations um, between stress from experienced racism as well as um, unprotected anal intercourse. And then thinking about racism and um, HI physiology and how they could potentially be working together. So race is not biological, it's social, and it reflects exposure to racism and other deleterious structural forces. Um, so racism leads to biological weathering, right? Um, Geronimus and McEwen and Stellar and uh, many folks back in the 90s actually established some of this really critical data. Um, and that is the idea that Black people experience more physiologic wear and tear because of their experiences with racism throughout their lives, right? And this is also known as a greater kind of allostatic load. Um, and a study by Geronimus showed that Black women um, in that study, we're actually 7.5 years older by biological age even than white women, even though, even though they were at the same chronological age. And they looked at the length of telomeres, which is biological marker um, for uh, aging, and showed significantly um, uh, less telomere length. So in part, these chronic processes, along with epi epigenetic changes, right, with greater exposure to, um, you know, toxic environments, to violence, to all sorts of um, kind of uh, disproportionate exposures that um, Black gay men face, um, these epigenetic changes that um, we're just starting to kind of learn more, that we're learning more about, really ex explain some of these differences by race when you control for a lot of these other factors. But we know HIV already accelerates the aging process, right? That even in patients who are virally suppressed, that low level inflammation in the viral reservoir um, can lead to higher rates of heart disease and dementia and um, the furtherance of, of, of chronic, um, chronic diseases. So the a critical question, right, is how does living with racism as well as homophobia and HIV work together to shorten the lives of black MSM with HIV? So now getting to the last objective. So now I wanna talk about um, HIV diagnosis really as a potentially um, transformative moment for HIV research and intervention and talk a, um, about a couple of the studies past and present um, that I'm working on. Um, so this was a study um, looking at the diagnosis experiences of Black men who have sex with men in New York. Um, and essentially, we were trying to explore the impact and meaning of a diagnosis for these men and how it's changed over time. So we purposely recruited a sample who were diagnosed in the 80s and the 90s and more recently. Um, and in terms of demographics, this was a small pilot study. It was an N of 16. A majority of them were gay identified, ages 25 to 55. Uh, most were actually employed for wages and had stable housing. Um, and the majority made less than 20,000 per year. And the diagnosis years ranged from 1985 to 2016. So the major themes, first was diagnosis trauma, right? And kind of breaking that down to some sub themes. Um, the feeling of direct trauma uh, with receipt of the diagnosis, this idea of vicarious trauma, that receiving a diagnosis were called for these participants, other folks in their lives who either passed away from H HIV AIDS or um, have had really kind of um, traumatic experiences living with HIV. Um, and then HIV related and in intersectional stigma, right? This idea that um, stigma itself uh, can be bring up many feelings of trauma for these men. Um, the second theme was this la was lack of patient-centered care, both with the medical provider and with the healthcare system. Um, a lot of participants talking about direct words that were used at the time of diagnosis um, that led them to um, really kind of negative emotional feelings and led them to spiral. Um, and then also interactions with the system just being really difficult to actually get in care um, and stay in care. And then the last theme was kind of this process of um, acceptance of the diagnosis, how these men were able to disclose to other people in their lives, find social support, um, and kind of uh, find this self-motivation and personal growth um, to stay on treatment. 
So I, I just wanted to highlight um, one of these kind of comparisons between someone diagnosed early on in the 80s and one and a couple of the participants diagnosed most recently. So this participant who was in his 50s diagnosed in 1987 said, I was told I had six months to live. So I was devastated and angry, confused, unsure, you know, in disbelief. I started acting out sexually, drinking more and doing recreational drugs. I had planned to get married. I had planned to have children. All my plans ended. You're getting ready to die. When they told me it was a death sentence, I was right there at the beginning. There were no options. I still wanted to dream, but I decided my life was over. You were a leper. You didn't want to be stigmatized. You didn't want to be discriminated against. When I was diagnosed, what we saw as black gay men was one week Peter was here, the next Peter wasn't here. What happened to Peter? He went home. That was a very common phrase in the 80s and 90s. Usually meant he went home to die. So you can see this universal experience that gay men had at that time, right? Um, in terms of feeling that uh, direct trauma and that um, very short, shortened uh, time to live, that death sentence, um, you can see this influence of intersectional stigma playing a role there for this patient as a black gay man. And then comparing that to um, a patient diagnosed in 2016, who said, I felt as if I did something wrong. I felt my life spiraling down. I did drink more significantly than I ever have. I used marijuana. I didn't say much to others. I became angry. At first I saw it as a death sentence. I thought maybe yes, there's a possibility of a life-threatening diagnosis. And this other participant said, um, who was diagnosed in 2014, I come from a mixed household. My mom's Southern Black American and my dad's Jamaican. On my mom's side, it's a lot more brutal. I didn't want them to know at all. I had an aunt who died of AIDS and when she died, it was just a lot of gossip about who she was sleeping with. I was nine and it was a lot of horrible talk about gay people, even though the man she was dating didn't identify as gay. I'm from the South. The South can be very homophobic. The only reason why my aunt died is because she didn't tell anybody. So the way I see kind of structural racism working here is that you have black gay men who are diagnosed at, you know, one in the 80s and one just a few years and a couple of just a few years ago, um, showing those th those same themes kind of coming up of trauma, right? This idea that um, their lives will soon be lost. And this idea of intersectional, intersectional stigma that receiving that diagnosis um, and that vicarious trauma of understanding um, how folks have either died of AIDS in their lives or struggled to live with HIV because of their identity and their racial identity um, really is salient at the time of diagnosis. So that kind of led me to think about what interventions at diagnosis um, before a lot of this trauma kind of starts to propagate, we can think about. Um, so immediate antiretroviral therapy, also known as rapid ART, um, is essentially the idea that once someone's diagnosed, you're starting antiretroviral treatment, right? And that's because of a multitude of benefits, right? Quicker viral suppression, um, and that could lead to lower risk of all certain uh, medical complications later on. Um, and so this is a, a paper that we published last year with many names that you'll recognize, um, arguing specifically for a health equity approach where we are um, intentionally uh, discussing systemic racism at the time of diagnosis. But then realizing that there's just not a lot of data on what the experiences of patients are with immediate ART, um, luckily was able to receive an HIV center pilot and we're using a mixed methods approach um, to really kind of get a sense of what these experiences are and what the implications are for disparities in HIV care engagement. So our aims of this study are to number one, understand how patients cope with a new diagnosis after immediate initiation understand their perspectives and their psychosocial costs and benefits. Um, and this is among a predominantly Black, Latino, and MSM patient population recruited from our clinic across the street. Our second aim is to examine the association between IR and HIV-related stigma, medical mistrust, and retention in care. Um, and then third, to explore longitudinal patterns of clinical care engagement and patient perspectives on care engagement among newly diagnosed patients who have been offered IART.
Um, and this is our conceptual framework, um, which is a combination of the social ecological model and the theory of planned behavior. Um, and I won't dive too deep into this, but um, you know, I just wanted to point out that you know, our specific focus on HIV stigma and medical mistrust um, isn't just because those are interesting um, kind of variables to look at, but because they actually provide a window into systemic racism at work, right? So there are different approaches, even either kind of using a specific racism scale or thinking about some of these um, factors that are a result of systemic racism or travel along with systemic racism. So our goal in this model is to kind of get a sense of the uh, patient's perspectives on IR, how that relates to whether it alleviates or complicates uh, feelings of stigma or medical mistrust at diagnosis, how that influences their retention and care with an understanding that the multiple levels at which we understand IR at the policy change level, how people view it within communities, um, how an organization approaches IR, that interpersonal reaction at diagnosis and those individual experiences all have an impact as well. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention my involvement in um, HBTN 096, of which um, Bob is a co-chair. Um, and so uh, becoming involved in uh, this study early on has been a really wonderful experience because um, I think it's, it's one of these studies that is specifically looking at the role of systemic racism, right? So it's um, essentially going to be a community-based um, randomized control trial um, looking at an integrated um, intervention of health equity, intersectional stigma reduction, virtual peer support, and social media influencers um, in some of the most affected counties in the country, uh, mostly in the South, um, and essentially with the goal of reducing HIV incidence through increased PrEP uptake and increased ART uptake. Um, and this has been a, a wonderful experience because I think, you know, projecting forward, thinking about um, my past and, you know, some of my present work, um, this is a study that's um, looking specifically at how um, we address systemic racism, I think. So just ending, uh, finishing up, thinking about directions for the field. So, um, you know, I think that more mixed methods research um, to underscore the importance of narrative and individual experience to provide context and meaning to our epidemiological data is important to, um, you know, finally dealing with systemic racism for this population. Thinking about implementation science for high impact translational approaches, thinking about critical race theory as a framework for future studies, um, thinking about behavioral interventions for healthcare delivery systems to address systemic racism, as well as more robust measures um, beyond individual measures like the everyday discrimination scale and the internalized racism scale. But I wanna end with this question because this keeps coming up for me and I know coming up for a lot of us, um, it's how do we actually think transformatively in our research and move, move towards liberation for uh, black MSM generally and those living with HIV um, rather than tinkering with a system that continues to fail them. Um, and this last year has really kind of, um, I think, brought that, that greater question about how do we actually change these systems we're working within to the forefront. So what does transformation look like? I thought I would just throw some ideas out there. Um, that means immediate investments in Black, gay, and bisexual men, right? And that means monetary and financial investments and um, educational and economic opportunity. Um, that means a surge in mental health resources focused on race-based trauma. Um, that means Black, gay, and bisexual men living with HIV actually setting our research agenda, right? Not just being studied, but telling us what should be studied. Um, and increasing representation of Black, gay, and bisexual men among clinicians, providers, and researchers. Um, and then also HIV care in the non-clinical setting. You know, I spend a ton of my time in the clinical setting um, and I can see how those settings don't make this population feel safe. So how do we think about um, transformatively, particularly this year when we've had to move out of the clinical setting, how do we think about delivering care um, in non-traditional settings? So um, this last slide, just, you know, reminding everybody that we won't, I don't think we will end the HIV epidemic until we dismantle systemic racism, right? It's, it's that uh, inability to bend that curve um, early on in the talk.
And, you know, we all witnessed, unfortunately, we, we witnessed a lynching this past year. Um, and, you know, uh, I was actually a history major many, many years ago. And um, this was one of my uh, favorite pictures, which is um, a, a large group of Black protesters marching down Fifth Avenue in 1917. Um, all dressed in white, protesting the lynchings going on throughout the country um, uh, at that time and the kind of uh, marginalization and lack of opportunity for Black Americans writ large. And I think this is just to kind of emphasize that um, there's a long kind of historical precedent leading us up to the disproportionate numbers that we see. And also that the actual physical violence that results in loss of life um, is very much related to the systemic and structural violence um, that we're dealing with in our work. So many, many acknowledgements. Um, I won't go through all of these um, in, in particular, but uh, folks at the HIV Center, um, including uh, my fellows, co-fellows, um, and my scientific mentor, Bob, and my career mentor, Magda, um, and uh, folks at CEDAR, and my mentors there who were Dustin Duncan and Alan Benoit, as well as the HPTN 096 protocol team. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Afola. That was very rich and thought provoking on in, in so many levels. So much appreciated. Um, Stephen, I'm going over to you. Yes, thank you, Afole. Uh, we have a question from Patrick. Patrick says, Thank you for an excellent presentation, Afole, um, and for the shout out. I had a question about systemic racism within healthcare institutions. As an MD, what do you think about the expansion of the roles of nurses, nurse practitioners rather, and physician assistants to help address the lack of diversity in healthcare and lack of comprehensive care provided to minority, minority populations, specifically black gay men living with HIV? Will this help address the issue and or are there other structural changes we can consider? Uh, thank you, Patrick. Yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, I do think that NPs and PAs and kind of increasing our diversity among that workforce um, is clearly, I think, more low hanging fruit. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I think there's so much more work that needs to be done when it comes to shepherding um, physicians of color, particularly Black medical students, and thinking more specifically Black gay medical students through that system. There's a lot of barriers and there's a lot of kind of difficulties not only kind of getting in, but, all, but along the way um, because of the lack of diversity within the medical field. Um, so I do think that that, that, that certainly would be helpful. Um, I, still, I still definitely think that that effort to ensure that, um, that that's represented among physicians is really paramount. Um, and yeah, I think it's ter in terms of what we could do, uh, you know, just structurally, I think, you know, peer support and peer navigators and just thinking about the role of um, how do we work better with communities? How do we bring in folks who've been living with HIV for many years, um, who have so much to teach us and to teach other patients? How do we bring them into the model of care that we're giving? Um, and how do we do that very intentionally so that we're um, investing in those folks as well? Um, there's certainly models of that throughout the country, but I think, um, it could be much more widespread and much more widely adopted. Thanks, Ofole. Um, Claude says, Ofole, as always, you are an amazing communicator on such important issues and highlighting the importance of us taking up the mantle of integrating anti-systemic racism into our work and some important steps of how we do it. Her question is, how do you use your experiences in HIV to think about COVID and such concerns and mistrust of medical systems, government, and getting vaccinated among many in Black and Latino communities, including those already living with HIV. We have 11 of 40, 14 participants in CASA who are refusing to get vaccinated. How do we think about this? Well, thank you. Thank you, Claude, for, um, Claude's always so nice to me. So I appreciate, I appreciate you with that uh, preamble. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think that actually my experience experience has been with um, my patients that it's actually been quite successful. Like I'm thinking of the folks who have come in and have been hesitant or have said, I'm not getting the vaccine. Um, and really it's just, it's, it's taken kind of an acknowledgement that they're 
hesitancy is and their skepticism is completely understandable and natural and that we're going to kind of give time and space and, and, and appropriate and correct information um, for them to work through that. So for a lot of patients, I'm thinking about, you know, it took a couple, a couple visits, you know, a couple, maybe three, four visits um, to get them there, but a lot of them have gotten there. Um, I think experience working with um, HIV in the clinic has also proven to me that there are some patients who just do not trust the system. And that, 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 that uh, you know, that um, contract has been broken. Um, and so, unfortunately, I don't know if the medical establishment can do much or the research establishment can do much. That's going to have to come from folks in their community, their pastors, their priests, um, grandmothers, grandfathers, people that they trust to actually make that um, transition. It's, uh, there's only, there's so much that the system can do. Thanks, Apollo. Uh, Susan Tross says, Afole, this was an inspiring talk. Thanks for your kind words. Connecting to one small piece about concrete changes to make, what do you think about CBOs and non-traditional, non-medical contexts as places to deliver care? How about door-to-door -door outreach? Yeah, most definitely. So um, I think that there's so much more that we can be doing on this front. Um, there's an organization some of you might have heard of called the Ali Forney Center. Um, and they work with um, gay, home, gay and trans homeless youth uh, throughout the country. It's a really impressive group. And so I've you know, tried to be involved as much as I can over the last few years and um, volunteered there for a little bit. And one of their um, sites, you go in and you know, there's places where most of them are teenagers can play and do art and have fun and places where they can study. But there's also like a clinical space, right? Integrated into that environment um, where they could do prep and they can do um, HIV care and they can do all sorts of things. Um, and so I think that those non-traditional CBO settings um, are definitely an opportunity. Now they need to be, there needs to be appropriate investments. Those spaces need to be welcoming and those spaces need to um, have folks working there that kind of have a good and seamless um, understanding of how the healthcare system works for it not to uh, become complicated or become too much of a burden. But I do think um, in terms of thinking about how we get, move some of this care outside of the clinical system that that's uh, definitely a great, great idea. Thanks, Afole. Bob, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Stephen. And, and thanks again, Afole. It was really wonderful. Um, so this is a broad question to, to you and to all of us, actually, to think about. And it's got me thinking. Um, you, know, you, you, you threw in some stuff. You mentioned about um, impact of racism on our mortality. Um, you study even about telomerelating. Um, you know, I kind of late in my career, but I'm thinking more and more about the, you know, biological mechanisms, you know, so, so I guess my, my broad question is how do we think about the interaction of psychosocial impact of things like trauma and racism, and then the sort of more biological and even maybe biogenetic impact. Um, and I want to draw people's attention to, if, if some of you may have seen, there was a psychiatry rounds this week with several speakers, and one of them was um, a really fascinating woman, Marissa Spann, who is an associate professor of medical psychology in both psychiatry and pediatrics here at Columbia. And she spoke about, I'll just give you the title, um, Intergenerational Pathways, the Effects of Maternal Experience of Discrimination on the Offspring Brain. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm just throwing out there, you know, you or anyone can comment and, and there are other questions you can move on to, but um, how do we bring together, again, the psychosocial impact of things like systemic racism and trauma with what's happening at a biological mechanistic level? How do we study that, understand it, think about it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And um, I kind of skipped over this um, HIV ACEs pyramid from, and this is from NASTAD actually, I got it from one of their trauma-informed toolkits. Um, but I think it's, it's um, goes a little bit to your question, right? Like looking at the bottom, this isn't projecting very well, but looking at the bottom, this idea of intergenerational 
transmission of trauma and historical trauma and then structural racism and macroaggressions and social and cognitive impairment and eventually HIV infection and a bunch of behavioral health disorders and how that leads us to the top of the pyramid, which is folks who are virally unsuppressed and have poor quality of life. Um, and early death is what's missing here, right? Mm -hmm. That these folks are actually aging faster and dying earlier. Um, and there are these epigenetic changes happening along the way. And so I think, you know, our, our biomarkers um, are certainly, there's a lot um, to be desired and we need better biomarkers for um, a lot of these, um, kind of, you know, thinking about the aging process, thinking about, um, you know, risk of certain, developing certain chronic diseases. Um, that's, that's developing all the time, but I think we, we should be using them um, as we're moving forward, because that's the limit of our knowledge at this point. Um, and I think that there's certainly things that we can um, glean from some of those studies by integrating some, um, you know, some um, surveys, some, psychomet some psychometrics, as well as, some um, kind of biomarkers of chronic disease. Thank you. I was teasing Afole to say, I think we need people like you in with dual appointments in, in medicine and psychiatry to, to <laughs> bring these things together. <laughs> and thank you, Stephen, for posting that, that toolkit in the chat. Sure. Um, we have a comment from Ellen Benoit. Ellen says, wonderful to see you, Ofole, and thanks for doing this work. Would love to see, would love to hear more of your thinking on ways for Black gay men with HIV to set the research agenda. Community-based participatory research is a promising paradigm, but in my experience, a large national, large national funders are still learning about community needs. For example, how to get resources to them quickly enough. Mm. Hi, Helen. Ellen, I haven't talked to you in a very long time, but I hope you're doing well, and I'm glad you're here. Um, Ellen was one of my mentors on my CEDAR project. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think, you know, um, in terms of setting the research agenda, I think that a lot of the um, institutions we have in place that do set the research agenda, I think can do a lot more to have visible individuals um, in positions of authority who are able to, um, set the agenda, set the priorities and, and be at the table. Um, and I do think that there's uh, certainly with CBPR, you know, that's done with different, different um, studies, but I think even at a, like a higher level, we could be thinking, uh, we could be thinking about this and just looking to the NIH, right? It's, I think I've seen so many papers coming out from the NIH about um, the crisis, so, you know, in terms of black scientists and being able to recruit and retain them and um, different outcomes when it comes to funding and stuff like that. And um, I think that there, there's a lot to be done at that level um, rather than just a kind of uh, certain, the level of a research study um, in terms of setting a broad agenda about where we're gonna focus and where the money's gonna go. And I think that that being visible can actually be great for um, those communities as well to see that they're represented um, at the highest kind of highest levels. Thanks, Afole. Claude, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, thank you again. And um, you know, this is all making me think. And I'm I'm sorry to be a little bit obsessed with COVID at the moment. <laughs> it's hard not to be. Um, but you know, I was thinking about two things. One is Bob's question to you um, about mechanisms, and just for everybody else, Afole has you know recommended to me in Casa our cohort study of young people growing up with HIV. You know, really trying to learn actually about the impact of systemic racism, experience of um, aggressions, violence throughout their lives, and that's a little bit hard to do retrospectively. Um, so I was thinking a little bit, you know, now we have this opportunity where everybody's trying to look at another significant pandemic in COVID. And I highly doubt this is, you know, being placed where it should be. I'm on a PEDS study right now where I don't think there's one question on this. I mean, there are social determinants, but it's very, very small. So it does seem to me there is an opportunity 
to maybe actually think about this. It, you'd have to have a very big study, I understand, but just your thoughts on that to begin to really understand these biomedical mechanisms and how they can exacerbate the impact of um, you know, an, an illness that maybe we failed to do in HIV. Yeah. And your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, most, de most definitely. I think, um, you know, I'm thinking about COVID-19 all the time too, and I think it's hard not to fall into despair, but I think it's, it's also an opportunity, right? Because it has really kind of laid bare all of these um, issues, not, not just for folks who like didn't really understand that they existed before um, and are just kind of learning about racism. Um, but for folks who have experienced racism for most of their lives, I think that, um, you know, people try to um, move forward and still experience the richness of life and joy in their life. And they're not always thinking about their, like what racist experience happened or what happened on the news. Um, but this year you can't really escape it, right? It's everywhere and we're all home. And so even folks who have done things to suppress this trauma have had to face it this year in ways that they haven't before. So I do think that what that does is present an opportunity in terms of asking the right questions, framing the right questions to really start to um, unleash some of that, um, you know, some of the some of those stories that people have um, really tried to kind of keep out of, even when they're participating in a research study, right? Like a lot of people just want to move forward and they don't really want to like rip off that scab that will have them talking about something um, that was really difficult in their lives. Um, so yeah, so I've been thinking about that a lot. I think it presents a research opportunity if we're able to kind of make sure we're asking the right questions, presenting it in the right way um, to collect the data that we need to serve, to serve those communities. Thank you. If there are any other questions for Ofole, please feel free to unmute yourself. I don't, I don't have a question, but I just want to make a sort of broad comment, you know, bringing together both of these presentations. So we had, you know, really interesting, provocative stuff from both Leah and Ofole. And, you know, thinking about the future of our field and, you know, these wonderful younger people. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, the intersectionality, I guess I just want to comment on, you know, I mean, the, the trauma and, and the, the, the impact of, you know, racial discrimination, gender-based discrimination, and, and intersectionality of that um, is just, it's just, we just, I mean, we're aware of it, but we just need to understand it, frame it, and, and, and study it better because it's, um, these, are, these are intersecting um, trauma experiences that uh, these vulnerable populations are, are dealing with. And, um, you know, so it was nice to have these two presentations together. So I wanna thank you both. And the final comment from Claude. Uh, Leah, you, thank you so much for your really excellent presentation as well. Both you and Afole really gave us a very thought provoking, provoking morning. So appreciative. Thank you. Many other affirmations coming in. Bob, I think you summed it up uh, rather well, but if you have any other closing remarks. No, but just for all of us to collectively think about this, you know, and, um, you know, in the HIV Center as a, a cross core activity, which, you know, many of you are aware of, and I want to encourage participation, you know, we're, we're about to initiate a, um, a cross cutting um, scientific work group on thinking about um, the integrating, you know, equity and racism, et cetera, into our research. And I think we just need a lot of collective thinking to, to advance that. So I want to encourage participation in, in that, that think tank. <laughs> Thank you all. And um, it was a really great provocative morning. And we look forward to seeing you on April 22nd. of that date right, Stephen, for Ivan Balan, special rounds and, uh, and also bit of a celebration of, of Ivan Balan, who will continue to work with us, but is transitioning as well um, 
to, to Florida. And um, so please join us for that presentation and celebration. Take care, everyone. <laughs>